off with a little bit of overlap. Um, and who wasn't here for the first time? Uh -huh. um, well, um, I think it might be clear what's going on up to a certain point, and then some part will look a little strange, but if you ask me afterwards for the part that seemed unintelligible, it probably won't happen. So, um, why is that doing that? So this is a flat world. In a curved world, derivatives don't necessarily commute with one another. Uh, and then we have made xi pj delta j, which means that the derivative of xi with respect to xi is 1, as it should be, and the derivative of xi with respect to xj when j is not equal to i is 0. Okay? So this is just ordinary advanced calculus rewritten with commutators. Um, and then because of the symmetry of this, I can also let it include the derivatives with respect to the pi's because they're delta i j in the xi's. So when you take a partial with respect to pi, you're, you're involved with the commutators with the xi's, and it still works out delta i j as it should. So, um, so we have both kinds of derivatives with respect to pi and with respect to xi. And then if we want to add time in the interest of possibly having physics happen, then we have another another object, another operator whose um, commutator gives you the derivative with respect to time. And of course, that is the commutator version of Hamilton's equation. That, uh, the derivative should, uh, with respect to time should be given by a commutator with h. Um, and then we observe that this satisfies Hamilton's equations, and I won't go back over that again, but Hamilton's equations of motions are automatically satisfied here. And, and we observed that, um, and then I was reminding you um, that Hamilton's equations, that the derivative of the Hamiltonian of the energy operator with respect to Q is minus P dot, and the derivative of it with respect to P is Q dot, which is just part of the system that I just set up as a framework, that is coming from the quadratic Hamiltonian uh, and Newton's law. So maybe we should slow down here and just see that again. The, the energy is p squared over 2m, p being mv, right? And so that's 1 half mv squared plus v of q, the potential energy. And momentum is m dv, yeah, mv, m dq dt. And Newton says ma equals minus the derivative of the potential energy. So now we can take the derivative of h with respect to p, and that's 2p over 2m, which is just p over m, which is dq dt. And that's one of those equations relating the derivative of q with the derivative of h. And the other one, dq dh, is dv dq, because there isn't any q any p dependence over here. And dv dq is minus the force, and that's equal to minus dp dt. Um, um, and so we're done, right? P being uh, mv, m, m dq dt, so that's minus dp dt. And there's Hamilton's equations. And they're coming from the physics. They're coming from the fact that the Hamiltonian looks like that, and Newton's law. But on the other hand, maybe it's worth walking back and seeing this again. On the other hand, in the framework, in the just abstract framework of advanced calculus, 
that we set up, we have the PBT, um, is, is the is the commutator of H, which is minus HPI, but that by definition is minus the derivative of H with respect to Xi, <coughs> X being Q, of course. And DXI dt is the commutator of Xi with H, but that's exactly what we call the derivative of H with respect to PI, and there's Hamilton's equations. So Hamilton's equations here are just a mathematical consequence of the choice we made to do advanced calculus by representing everybody by commutators. Um, and of course you can see that this is like walking backwards through Hamilton's development in a certain sense because the next thing in Hamilton's development is that other equation about time. Uh, F dot is, just doing the advanced calculus again, um, dftt, all right, but that's dftq q dot plus dftp p dot, the expression in, that's a tautology and calculus for finding the time derivative of a function of two variables. But then we knew, because we had proved Hamilton's equations just now, that the q dot is the h to b, and p dot is the h to q, and this thing, taking the derivative with respect to q and the derivative with respect to p, and then doing it in the other order and subtracting, is called a Poisson bracket, and that's what Hamilton formulated as the evolutionary law instead of Newton's law for mechanics. Um, and you see, this is, this is the strong analog to the, the commutator. So in a certain sense, what we did was we started here and formulated everything in terms of commutators, but the formally they act like plus on bracket. And so it wouldn't be surprising if you're familiar with this formalism that it would that somehow you would abstractly get Hamilton's equations. But it is a little surprising and it's neat that it happens. So that's where we were. That's where I stopped. Um, let me forget about this slide. Maybe I keep this slide. Um, this is the definition of the Planck mass, the Planck length, and the Planck time. But if you wanted to see what I was about to say with it, you might have to memorize that. I think the thing that strikes me most about that is the mass is a square root of h. Yes. So. I brought that up. Where g is Newton's constant. But this is really a digression. I, don't, I think I, I would skip this slide. Um, but um, but the, reason, the reason for it is the following. Let me get it for you. Reason. Um, there it is on this slide. Yeah. You see, we were talking about L squared over time, distance squared over time. And if you use Planck mass length and time and put it in where I just wrote them, length squared here, time, uh, and cancel out appropriately, you get the ratio of Planck's constant to mass, h bar over n. And so you can identify the delta squared over tau with the, the diffusion constant with h bar over m. Uh, if you like, they have the same units. It's just a matter of comparing units. But the other remark I wanted to make was about Schrodinger's equation. Uh, because we had been talking about the diffusion equation, among other things, here is Schrodinger's equation, right? i h bar d sine dt is h psi, um, where h is p squared over 2m plus v, um, and turned into an operator. So that means the p is given by this as an operator. I'm just reminding you how quantum mechanics gets formulated in the Schrodinger way. And so p squared over 2m is a second order derivative. Um, and if you let the potential be zero, then this is Schrodinger's equation, which we can rewrite this way d psi dt is i h bar over 2m d squared psi dx squared. And the reason I wanted to remind you about that is because, remember, just at the beginning, by, by just looking at, um, at a process in discrete physics, we got Brownian motion. And then I reminded you that Brownian motion in the limit can be thought of as solving the diffusion equation uh, and with these same units, if you like, but no i, right? No i. Um, 
and then um, and then Schrodinger is exactly the same as the diffusion equation, except there's an I in there. And and we were talking about replacing time by I times time and rotating it back and forth. And when you replace time by I times time, then you go from diffusion equation to Schrodinger's equation. Um, and uh, and then, as long as I went that far, um, I want to make another remark. So, so that remark is this. Here's Schrodinger, d sine t is equal to i constant d squared psi dx squared. And what happens to this if you separated psi into its real and imaginary part, since it's a complex valued object? So I could write psi uh, as equal to psi O plus um, a psi E, let's say, plus I psi O. Right. I just had some reason for writing E and O, which is not really any reason at all at this point. But if I do that and then I separate this out, what will happen? Let's write it. So I get d psi e dt plus i d psi on dt um, is equal to, and now I multiply by i kappa, so that is going to give me i kappa d squared psi e x squared minus uh, kappa d squared psi i dx squared because i squared is equal to minus 1, right? Um, and then separate it out. Uh, and I have d psi e dt is equal to uh, minus kappa d squared psi odd dx squared and d psi odd dt. That's where I'm throwing these out and equating their corresponding scalars, uh, kappa uh, d squared psi e dx squared. So I have a, a linked pair of, of, of differential equations where the time derivative of the psi even is related to the second space derivative of psi i and vice versa, right? That's Schrodinger's equation too if you wanted to eliminate the i. Um, well, I don't particularly want to eliminate the i, but that's what I get if I do. On the other hand, what does that say about the diffusion equation and the relationship between Schrodinger and diffusion? Well, if you were, if you were doing this as we did, the diffusion equation, um, in time steps, right, in discrete time steps, then you could have the even time steps and the odd time steps, right? Mm -hmm. And then this would say that the, the derivative at the even time is, is related to the negative of the second derivative at the odd time, and vice versa. The derivative at the odd time will be related with a plus sign to the derivative at the even time. So that means that you could take the equations for the diffusion equation, which we were looking at before, and, and say, OK, we'll turn it into Schrodinger's equation by linking them in this funny way. We'll change a sign. It's no longer going to be the right formula for the probability of the particle moving back and forth. But we'll just change the sign, and we'll have these linked recursion that are, that's going on. And then this is saying that the odd ones are related to the even ones, and the even ones are related to the odd ones. And we did it by switching the sign at, at the uh, nth place. So over here, it is minus 1 to the n. That's what replaces the i, minus 1 to the n, where n is either even or odd, right? Uh, or that's the nth place. And so then you could say, if you wanted to, that what happened here was that the i got replaced to it with minus 1 to the infinity uh, because 
you know, uh, you're letting uh, you're letting the the recursion, and you're taking the limit of the recursion as n goes to infinity, and then it's no longer even or odd. Doesn't right, work right. But on the other hand, you could say I take the limit of the even ones and I take the limit of the odd ones independently, and then then it will work right. You will have there won't be any limit for psi n uh, in the in the recursion. They're, they're, they're alternating to, they're mixed up with one another. But if you look at, at, at the even ones and take the limit, then you get the psi even that I'm pointing to here. And if you take the odd ones, then you get the limit of them, and you get the two parts, the complex parts. So there's one, there, so you can think of it as a generalized diffusion equation in which there isn't there really any limit to it unless you separate it into the even and odd levels of the recursion and then you get the even and the odd, and then you get the real and imaginary parts for the Schrodinger equation. So, so the, the view of I as an oscillation plus and minus one actually fits into uh, thinking about Schrodinger's equation in terms of the diffusion equation. Now again, one would like to go farther with that, but that's, that's the best I can remark on it at the moment. Okay. Um, the next stage in this is to think about general equations of motion in this in this in this um, general formalism. So what does that look like? Um, that looks like this. Um, I'm sorry, that's that's sort of um, there's the dot. Here, the xi's were the positions, right? So I would like to know how they're changing in time. Well, how do they change the time? Of course, they are the commutators of m of h. But on the other hand, that's some expression. It would be a law if, if there was some expression gi uh, in the algebra that told me what it was. So that would be an equation of motion in this general system. So, so then, what can we say about that? Well, you now have a collection of these elements, g1 through gd, where right, or that's a dimension of the Thing. I haven't even bent it down to three or anything. Um, and um, I have these elements, and um, there's something like momenta. Remember, this is all echoing back to Feynman's thing, where he had x dot, xi dot, right? This is xi dot. Um, um, there's something like momenta, so let's do what physicists do and compare them with the things that are sort of like momentum in the flat space, the PIs. So I, I, I'll let gi be pi minus ai, which is just um, just a way of comparison. It's now the ai that's unknown, all right? But you see where I'm going if you're used to this formalism. I want the curvature that this collection creates. That is, I want to see how these don't commute with one another. How do they not commute with one another? Well, compute it, pi minus ai, commutator pj minus aj. And if you work that out, you'll see you're going to get pi, pj, that, that's commuting. And you're going to get ai, aj, and that's not commuting necessarily. And you're going to get pi's with aj's and ai's with pj's. And it's like this is what you look at. And then you read that out and you see that's the ith derivative in the x xi direction of aj minus the j derivative of the ai plus the commutator of ai with aj. Um, that uh, is a familiar expression to people who study gauge theory. That's the curvature of the gauge connection, where the gauge connection would be the AIs. <coughs> and and if, you take, um, if you take that in one of its simpler forms, you will get electromagnetism. Uh, if you take it in a somewhat more complicated form, you get a, a more general gauge theory. So, so then, at this point, it isn't at all um, uh, surprising that Feynman was getting the electromagnetic formalism out of it when he did what he did, which we were talking about at the beginning. Because you see that there's no question that you're going to land on something like gauge theory if you start doing what I did. And what did I do? Nothing very complicated, really, other than the notion that I'm representing derivatives by commutators and following out the formalism, right? Um, the rest of it is watching what happens to the way things don't commute or do commute. Um, now, 
the generalization of a quadratic Hamiltonian would be something like this guy, where these are unknown coefficients. So I'm going to assume that they are at, at least behaving mostly like scalars, so that they commute with the x's um, and they're symmetrical. And here's here's a quadratic Hamiltonian in the general sense. And then you can play with this and calculate that the uh, xi xj dot is gij. Now maybe it's on the next slide, and I'm going. I have various calculations on these slides, and it's too much to ask that you follow the details of all these calculations, but maybe I point to something as I go along. But, um, but you see, in Feynman's original derivation, uh, this was a delta ij, okay? And he was getting electromagnetic formalism out of a very simple gij, all right? Um, but, but we could play with this in more general form like that. And then gij is, has the feel of a metric. Um, so um, that's what I'm deriving here. Um, and these are all just simple algebraic things that you have to, have to stare at carefully in order to make sure that they're working right by expanding in commutators and so on. So I, I think I will not bother you with this one, the fact that it turns out that xi xj dot is the gij. Um, but this slide is summarizing certain things that happen. Another thing that happens is that the calculus formula works right. The cal what is the calculus formula? You want f, this is the time derivative, and the calculus formula says that the ith derivative of x with respect to xi times xi dot plus the ith derivative of f with respect to um, Oh, I'm sorry, that's fine. Um, I'm just putting it on both sides, right? If I'm working non-commutative, not, not, if I was working in commutative world, then you, would, you wouldn't care that I wrote this on this side and, and multiplied it by that. Or if I put it on this side and multiplied by the same thing. But in non-commutative world, I have to keep track of the order of multiplication. And I average them. So, so this, is, this, this is just saying, that I sum over the derivatives of the variables in time times the derivatives of f with respect to the variables, right? Um, but it's saying it in the averaged way that I need to say it when I'm in a non-commutative world. So this is the advanced calculus formula as it should appear in the non-commutative world. And as I said, there, there is, in general, no reason why this should be true. I have to have the Hamiltonian adjusted right in order for this to work. And remember, we decided that we were going to take the Hamiltonian to be related to the P's. It's going to be quadratic in the P's. And then it will work. Um, and that basically is the only way it's going to work. So this is an example of getting the constraints to work right in between the uh, non-commutative world and the ordinary commutative world, in between the discrete physics and the uh, ordinary physics, if you like, because the non-commutative world is actually expressing the discrete physics. Okay, um, that's first constraint. Um, and uh, you could then ask, well, what will happen if I try to add on higher constraints? And that's what I'm going to talk about for a little while. And I forgot whether my next slide starts that or whether it goes. Yeah, I have a couple more remarks about this, but this one you don't need. And this one is fun to see, even though it's very technical. We, we, we worked out just a moment ago, without the details, that this happens. And that you should think of this as a kind of a metric, right? Now, if you are thinking of it as a kind of a metric, then it would be natural to think of it as um, uh, being related to a famous connection called the Levi-Civita connection. And this is what the Levi-Civita connection looks like, a funny formula, where delta i is the derivative with respect to using this as the derivative. Uh, I didn't write that there, um, but you'll see it happening. Um, 
You see, I, I, I'm going well. I wanted to point out to you where, where you would see that in, in this calculation. Down in the bottom of the calculation, you see me writing something like GJK commutated with XI dot. And by that, I'm calling that delta I of GJK, right? The minus sign means it should be in the other order. That means that my ith derivative of the GJK is represented not by the PI, but by the XI dot. Just like in Feynman originally, where he was representing his derivative with respect to the variable of space variables by taking the commutator with respect to his momentum up there. That momentum. So it would have been better if I had written that. But the thing is, I am going to I am going to look at the um, I'm going to look at some derivatives of the acceleration. There's the acceleration. I'm going to look at some derivatives of the acceleration, and I'm going to take two of them, and I end up getting the levy to be the connection out of the derivatives of the acceleration. It's interesting to see that that happens, that differential geometry is going on. I want to speak about this without making you read all that. Um, it, it takes a long time to read it carefully or to write it out carefully. And maybe better to never read it and only write it out, you know. Uh, but what happens in the middle of this is that all of this is controlled by the Jacobi identity. You start doing the commutators and then it's the Jacobi identity that pulls everything together. So, um, so there's some differential geometry going on in here that would be, would be good to understand. In the end, what you find when you do this is that you get that you get an equation like this, that the second derivative in, the, in this form is equal to a scalar kind of thing, um, an analog of a gauge field, and, uh, and the motion related to the levy to be connection. So it's an analog of classical physics coupled with gauge theory. That's what comes out of the formulas. But we'll not try to say too much more about it. I did want to tell you a little bit about what happens to Feynman's derivation. And you remember way back at the beginning, I said it's motivated by Feynman's derivation, these considerations. And that Feynman took the H field, which I'm now writing as B, um, as x dot cross x dot. And and that he's going to take his basic derivative to be commutated with the xi dots. But I'm doing something a little more general, maybe. As it says in the slide, I'm not assuming any commutation relations whatsoever. I'm going to get electromagnetic formalism for you without doing anything other than one constraint, and I'm not assuming that these xi's have some special commutation relations that they commute with one another or anything. And I'm defining E to be the time derivative of x dot, assuming there is a time derivative. And I remind you, you'll see what goes on in a moment, I remind you that the vector cross product is defined this way. That the kth component of the vector cross product is the sum of epsilon i, j, k, a, i, b, j, where epsilon i, j, k is a funny thing called the epsilon, which is uh, returning numbers uh, if you give it one of three numbers. Like epsilon, suppose your coordinates are one, two, and three, right? Epsilon one, two, three is one. Epsilon two, one, three is minus one. Switch any two and it changes sign. And if any two of them are equal, it's zero, epsilon one, one, Two is zero. Okay. Is that That's an alternating the metric? I'm sorry. Is that an alternating metric? It's an alternating uh, object. Uh, object. Yeah. <laughs> right. Alternating. It's an abstraction of the non-commutative higher level thing. Right? Oh. So to give you the plus and minus in the right place of the yeah. right. So so for example, if you wanted the third, if you wanted the third component of a cross b, uh, then you would have one, two, three. And two, one, three, and those are the only ones that could work, right? 
and uh, you would have A1, B2 minus A2, B1. And that's the correct formula for the first, com the third component of the vector cross product. Right. Um, so, so that's the way I'm thinking about the vector cross product. And now you see that if, if these guys don't commute, if AI doesn't commute with AJ, then, uh, then you would get the commutator of AI with AJ when you did that with itself. So the self-commutator, self-commutators will come in when you take the self-cross product. Okay. Um, and, uh, and then there's our derivative written out in full. I mean, written out at least. The i-th derivative of f with respect to space is, by definition, this guy, which I'm calling covariant derivative, because after all, these derivatives don't commute with one another. They didn't in Feynman either. Um, and then I define the time derivative of f partial with respect to t of f is f dot minus the usual formula. This is also a piece of advanced calculus. If you have, an, if you have extra time variance in some function, along with the internal time variance that happens in the xi's of which it is a function, then you get that the time partial with respect to time of it is given by this difference here. That the total diff partial with respect to time plus this is equal to the full time derivative of f. And our old advanced calculus formula, which you have to do an exercise or two with to believe, right? Um, maybe advanced calculus gets a little hazy by the time you get to thinking about that formula. But that one should be true in the non-commutative world. I demand it to be true. And I don't insist that I have a commutator formula for that. But I could. I, I could ask for another guy who, who represents that derivative if I want to. But what I've done is I've defined certain kind of temporal behavior by insisting on that. And when I talk about the partial with respect to time in writing down something that looks like how I like Maxwell's equations, that's the partial I'm using. All right? And that's all I'm assuming, nothing else. And then you will find that you get the formalism of electromagnetism coming out of the epsilon, which is the key other piece of formalism, and the framework that we set. So this is almost more surprising than uh, Feynman's, I think. Um, but maybe, uh, maybe it seems like it would become a kind of a yawn by right now that these things are working. But, here, but here's what happens, all right? So, um, so you get that um, given my definition of E, which was, what was my definition of E? There is it on the board? Yes. So the definition of E is it's a time derivative of x dot. And B is x dot cross x dot. They're both explicitly defined. Then you will have this formula, x double dot <coughs> B plus x dot cross B. The divergence of B is zero. Um, you will get an interrelationship between B field and E field equal not to zero, but to B cross B. And you will get an interrelationship between E field and B field in relation to this operator on x dot. Okay. Um, and so that's a generalized electromagnetism. And you could ask what would happen in the limit where you would expect B cross B to go to zero, but I'm not sure that what does happen there. How does this look? I don't want to spend all my time deriving it, but it's amusing to see how you can derive it in a pictorial way. So in a pictorial way, everything depends on the epsilon identity. The epsilon identity is this guy, if you've ever seen it, which expresses two tied epsilons. You see, I have them tied by an index, epsilon ABI, epsilon CBI. This is what I've drawn here, epsilon ABI, epsilon CBI, common index I, sum on I, is equal to a Kronecker delta ADBC minus and across Kronecker deltas like that. And this is a tautology, an amusing tautology, which is very useful. Uh, for example, suppose you have one, two, three, and one, two, three, right? Then they have one and one, and two and two, and a three in there, right? Well, that, that will be one, right? 
because it's one, two, three, one, two, three. One. Now this one is zero because this goes one to two and this goes two to one, right? But this one is one to one and two to two is one. And when you switch the order, you'll get the other one. And when two of them are equal, the two on the right will cancel each other out. So this diagram expresses exactly what's happening with the epsilon there. Um, and we would use this over and over again. I just wanted to show you uh, some music to see how you use it. But the way you use it, the way I use the diagrams is um, like this. Dot product is tying two things together by a little line. Because that means you're summing over the common index, right? A is the index on A, A is a vector, has an index. That's a little line coming down from it. The other one is a vector, and I tie their indices together, so I sum over all the common indices. So A1, B1, A2, B2, A3, B3 is the dot product of A and B, okay? Now the cross product is tying it into an epsilon, epsilon I, epsilon, epsilon I, J, K, right? So there's the cross product. Um, the i-th the j-th derivative of f is by definition this, and the f dot, um, in a, the formula we had for it was, it's dt of fi, and then xi, uh, xi times the uh, uh, derivative of that with respect to that. Did I lose a dot? Um, <laughs> Yep, lost a, lost a dot, right? By definition, the derivative of this should have a dot on that because that's the deriv time derivative of the ith variable multiplied by the derivative of it in the direction of the ith variable, right? It'll come up again. So, uh, so um, what was the line down from the x? <laughs> right? In, in terms of these indices, what was the, just the straight line down from the f mean? Straight line just means an index. That's, um, what, I, that's what I thought was it. Yeah, good? right. So um, let's, let's yeah, go yeah, straight. Yeah, just so it's clear. Uh, okay. I have something which has an index. But I will, I will turn it into a, a, a diagram by, by putting a block or a box and writing a line going down like that with the index. And then sometimes I, I uh, don't bother to write the index because you know there should be an index there. Yeah, okay. So these make things make life easier to watch what's going on. Um, and then the, 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 um, what happens with the del cross, the curl, the curl, the famous curl. Del cross is the cross product formally of the derivative operator with a would be f, right? No cross. Um, and but the but the derivative of an f is f um, uh, commutator x dot. Um, and um, and then what happens is you get minus f x dot with the prop, with the thing in there. I, I don't want to bother you with it, other than knowing that you can do that. But then I wanted to show you a piece of the derivation. So here's the formula. There it is, correctly dotted, right? That's the formula for the time derivative of f, right? There it is, right? And that's our definition that's making things work, right? Um, so this just says time derivative of f, uh, full time derivative of f is the partial time derivative of f plus the usual advanced calculus time derivative, which is derivatives of the variables multiplied by the corresponding derivatives with respect to those variables, which in this case is its commutator, right? And tied together because it's the same index, sum. Okay. I really like that one. So yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Like now, um, diagram. now I wrote it out. Now, now I'm writing it out. So I wrote out the commutator. So this is x dot fx dot minus x, x dot, f, okay? Now it's all written out, right? Now I want x double dot. So I put an x for everybody. I get an x dot here because, uh, because this is one dot away, right? There's the f. So undot this by one and you get to here. 
And then what about these? Um, it's supposed to be, I'm supposed to be putting in x dot for f, right? Yeah. So I put in x dot for f, and I have dots everywhere, right? Oh, but if you now go down to here and go backwards up, you'll see what I did. Because the epsilon identity says that this guy here, this guy in here can be replaced by cutting him out this way, or by crossing him over. And maybe I should draw it on a blackboard so you see what I'm saying. Yeah. Somebody got a minus sign and somebody didn't, right? The uh, epsilon identity says that you can do that with a minus sign and you get a plus sign when it crosses over. So this would have a minus sign and that would have a plus sign. One of them is one of them is opened up in parallel and the other one is crossed over. Now by diagram I did what I could have done by a lot of algebraic writing. And that's what goes in this direction in this direction, parallel, or crossed over. When you cross over, this guy is connected to this guy. So you see this is connected to this and it's crossed over. Here they're next to one another and in parallel. But that says that what you are looking at here is a triple cross product. So we get bt x dot and we get x dot crossed with x dot cross x dot. It's amusing, right? Because now, now you see what I got, right? I got the, the Lorentz formula. This is E, and this is H, x dot cross H, and B, okay? So that's how, that's how it works, and then you, you keep on uh, playing this game with the B. Um, might as well do one more. Um, it's sort of like eating peanuts after all. I want to go B. The del dot b is, um, is taking the sum of the derivatives of b, right? Um, but b, that's b times x dot minus x dot times b. But b is x dot cross x dot. Oh, but you see, the little y and this, they, they don't care. You can push them either way. And you get the same result. So again, this one is that zero. So that, that's the proof that the divergence of the b field is zero is because of this little topological notation change between one and the other. It doesn't change the cyclic order. It's the epsilon again, not changing the cyclic order of the epsilon between the two, so they vanish. Um, and, and then the other calculations about uh, the other equations are of the same ilk. So, um, so this is very amusing to do in this form, diagrammatic form. And, um, and if I had more time about the diagrammatic form, I would say a bit more. In fact, I kind of want to say it, so I'll say it now and then go on to the rest. I, got, I like these diagrams and I play with them all the time in topology and in this. Um, and recently, this is a digression, but I think you'll find it amusing. Um, recently, I got caught by a whole bunch of papers by Leonard Susskind and his collaborators which assert um, the following uh, dicta, uh, which they write this way, EPR equals ER, which says non-locality in quantum mechanics, that's Einstein, Rosen, and Podolsky, um, uh, is equal to Einstein-Rosen bridge. Einstein-Rosen bridge is a wormhole, right? Um, so what they're saying is that non-locality in quantum mechanics ought to be compared with, measured with, or made identical to um, the non-local connection that happens when you have a wormhole between two, yeah, uh, I'll manage that, a wormhole between two um, locations. So, um, so that the reason why that's an interesting thing is, is because after all, these are black holes and there is an event horizon. Let me 
sort of draw it up in there somewhere, in a member or something like that. Um, and, um, and here's Alice who's trying to communicate with Bob over here by uh, using an EPR pair, a non-local quantum, uh, quantum element. And, um, and, they, and, and, and she can't get through the non-local quantum element um, because it's a quantum, a non-local quantum element. There's no way to classically get through it. And there's no way to get it classically through the wormhole either. But they could sort of meet at the horizon. So there are a lot of analogies like that. Um, and, and so, and so th this is, so he's asserting that connectivity of space is related to wormhole connectivity. And um, you could scratch your head over this at the level of the uh, complex differential geometry that is usually thought of as relativity. But on the other hand, if you're somebody who draws diagrams about, about these things, then, then you, you get another take on the thing. Because here is a local state, psi, quantum state, a vector, just like I did over there, all right? Different, length, different, different context, same kind of language. Here is an entangled state which has two tensor ends. One is for Alice and the other is for Bob. And then there, uh, and then there is um, the sort of thing that one thinks about in, in this kind of subject where, for example, Alice makes a measurement. Um, and, and she measures only in the left end and on the left end of the quantum state. But now there's a brand new quantum state which looks like this, this vector, which I'll just sort of form it a little bit like that, that's psi prime. It's dropped out of Alice's recognition, except she knows what she measured. Uh, and there's a new psi prime for Bob, and, and you play with that, okay? Um, but then, in this diagrammatic, what are you doing in terms of space and diagram? That's the semiotic thing that's interesting, because you see, what you're saying is, here is, here, is ordinary space. And here is what I'll call diagrammatic space, right? And when we do, when we write quantum thinking uh, for quantum information thinking in terms of tensor networks or diagrams, then we're combining the tensor networks with the space. And, um, and it's a new space. Now, why not think about that? and not worry about this conjecture. Um, that's more rigorous mathematically, but it doesn't necessarily touch this conjecture. So you can think of, of what you're doing when you're doing quantum information theory as augmenting the ordinary classical space with these tensor networks which describe the quantum part. Um, and they uh, instantiate connectivities that aren't there in the same way that the ordinary classical connectivity is here. You can drive your car from Alice to Bob. You can't drive your car through the tensor network. But on the other hand, when you do certain operations, the connectivity that's implicit in the tensor network is um, operating to get in partial information across these gaps. So, um, so that's uh, an interesting thought, I think. And it might be that some of the speculations that Susskind makes about limits of tensor networks turning into the general relativity uh, could actually be verified if you start thinking a lot about what's going on with the tensor networks. So, um, so that's of course similar to this where I'm playing with uh, these, these little tensor networks attached to no space at all except the formalism of the non-commutative world. So you got, you got such the, such the formal lecture on that on YouTube. I'm sorry. You can get Suskin's formal lecture on that on, on YouTube. If you want to watch, look at the, that yeah, lecture. There are lectures on the YouTube of Suskin. Are you recommending yeah, yeah. I would I recommend all yeah, of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But right. the one, there's one specifically related to this also. Yeah, yeah, I know. He talks about tensor networks. Um, but I, I, am, uh, I am advocating that one can actually make a space here. Um, and, and for example, one way to make a space here is that there's a new point here, let's call it E for the entangled guy, and there are points here, A and B, and I have to tell you how to extend the topology of the ordinary space to include the tensor network, and I'm going to do it in, um, in the simplest way I can. 
I have to tell you, what is the neighborhood of this point? And the neighborhood of this point is both A and B, and it's solid. It's not a house of earth. I wouldn't, I wouldn't put it exactly like that, but uh, that's absolutely correct. I think, I think of where I put it is that you're setting up a space by setting up a quantum space, which implies a box, which gives you the space of the connection between Alice and Bob. And yeah. thinking about that is a, an engineering way of thinking about exactly what you just said. Mm -hmm. Both are, are not mirrors, but parallels of one another. So I think that plays an awful lot of this so-called mystery of the EPR and all these connectivities. Yeah. We, I, I think we could talk more about that, but let me, let me give you a quick tour of the rest in a few minutes. Okay. Um, we're getting out of that. Seven, and I'm going to, seven minutes, plenty of time. I, <laughs> Still seven many, minutes, many, plenty of time. How, how many more minutes? Seven. 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 I told you that I would make those slides available, so you know uh, you can look at this part. This this part of the slides is talking about something well known about Einstein's equations and the Bianchi identity. But earlier I had talked about how the Bianchi identity is related to commutators. So we'll skip this. Um, and I want to talk about constraints for a moment. Okay, for the last few minutes. Now, as I said, with constraints, we do need to do these averagings. Um, we need to say that the the um, the constraint for the constraint version of the non-commutative version of x times y is x y plus y x over two, or go through all permutations if you have more variables. You, you really need, unfortunately, to do that kind of thing. Um, I'm going to let the space variables be q now. I have a Hamiltonian h. I have theta dot is theta h. Qi dot is Qih. And then I chose a, a notation for that, but maybe it should have just been left as Qi dot hi. All right. Um, and, uh, and, and we have all the things that we had before. d theta, d qi is theta with respect to pi, and vice versa. And then I can state what the constraints are. So for example, the first constraint is that theta dot should be equal to the sum of qi dot theta i. Right? And we saw that, we saw earlier that it was plausible at least that it's satisfied if you take h to be equal to that. First constraint. Second constraint. Second constraint is this one, um, which is uh, just what happens with the second derivative. And now, I'm, at this point, I'm just going to show you this, and you would have to stare at it a little more carefully. But that that's just what happens with the second derivative. It's just ordinary mass calculus. Um, but then there's also differentiating the first constraint. And then the two of them together give you what we call the second constraint, which is this. All right? So then, you want that to be true. What does that mean? Um, well, it turns out um, it turns out that you can simplify it a bit by doing some commutative play around to be this. If this says that the i j derivative of theta, and remember that's commutator with q i dot, right? The i j derivative of theta, then take its commutator with q j dot and q i dot, and that should be equal to zero. Okay. Um, I said something wrong uh, because the ith derivative that I'm using is the standard ith derivative, okay? Just with respect to the pi, okay? So in the end, the second constraint is that first you take the derivatives of theta in the standard way, and then you take the derivative of that in the qj dot direction, and then in the qi dot direction and that should be equal to zero. A complicated little condition, right? What the heck does it mean? Okay. So, um, so um, you, can, um, you can rewrite it this way. That, that, is, that doesn't help. It just abbreviates it a little. Uh, but I define now y to 
be equal to theta qi dot. Okay. And then it says non y, non j, theta ij, usual derivatives, equals zero. And you could then play with it a bit, um, like this. Sorry, these slides are a little small to me. But I have my gij's, which I'm going to write in upper index. My h is written in upper index here. Sorry, the shifts in language. It should be all maybe more uniform. It is in the paper, but not in the way I cobbled together the slideshow. So here's my h, simplified a little bit. Um, I'm assuming that the GRJs commute to Qs. And then we did this before. We, showed, we indicated that this commutator is GRJ. All right. That's going to be the metric idea. Um, and then I'm verifying this. But what am I verifying? It's an interesting thing to verify, that when you take the i not the novel, that, 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 that covariant derivative of a theta, then what you get is gij summed on j against theta. So it has a nice form in relation to the metric. That's what it actually looks like. Um, and then you can write down what the constraint looks like. Because you see, the constraint looks like summing on gij's and then summing on gij's again with the thetas to red differentiated with that little formula. That's what's supposed to vanish. It's supposed to vanish. Um, and you could ask, what does the constraint say if you let theta itself be the metric? And then you get this. Well, so far, one is still in the dark. Um, what would that mean about the metric? And this was where we were a long, long time ago um, when Clive was still with us, and Clive observed, Clive Kilmister observed, that this thing means the same as this equation here, written in a, in a in an tensor invariant way, that's a covariant derivative, in the usual Ricci tensor uh, um, uh, for a back in general relativity, um, that it means the same thing as that. And, um, and so that leads into a, a, a really very interesting investigation of what, what is happening here. Um, what I have in the rest of the slideshow is an outline and in the paper a very complete, uh, uh, careful derivation uh, of what Clive did, all right? So that you can start with, um, no, I didn't say this is true in general, I said at the pole, of geodesic coordinates, I forgot to say. Okay, so this this equation um, is uh, that this is the sorry that this is the same as this is true at the pole of geodesic coordinates for general relativity. So so, so we look at something. There's a two thirds here point on the fact that one of the dimensions gives a zero in that second term of the bottom equation. Is that where it's coming from? Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't quite. You've got the two thirds in the second equation and the second term. Is that two thirds coming because you get a zero from one dimension? Or where's the two thirds coming from? Um, so let me let me spend just a few minutes giving you a, a sort of picture of how you get to this tensor equation. Yes. But then. The thing is still very mysterious because what I'm going to show you is that I can start. Well, let me do it. Um, so um, here's the Levy to be. You probably see the dot more easily than I do. Here's the Levy to be connection in the standard form. Um, and there are some symmetries. And then. Um, you can assume at the pole of geodesic coordinates um, that, um, that there's further symmetry. And this discussion of geodesic coordinates can be found not in nice detail in Eddington's book on general relativity, if you want to see it. That's clearly where Clive started. Right? So we, you can find discussion of geodesic coordinates elsewhere, but but the one that's most relevant to the things I'm saying is the end. Um, so then you have the general formula for, you know, this is, this is not something you can read easily in a talk, but I want to give you a picture. So, um, so then you, you have the general formula for the, 
for the curvature. And at the pole, the, these things become simpler. There are certain symmetries of the Riemann tensor. Um, and then you start, um, you start doing various, um, various uh, uh, algebra with these using the symmetries. And you get a reduction of, uh, of the Christoffel symbol at the pole in terms of the curvature. You get a, a, a relation that tells you about the derivatives of the metric in terms of the curvature, and then you introduce the rigid tensor, and um, and and then um, and then you don't need to read that, and then you find that um, that this expression involving the metric is equal to two thirds of the rigid tensor, um, and that's where the two thirds came from. Thank you. Thank you. And, uh, and then you need to re one needs to wants to rewrite it in in a, in a tensor invariant way. So you need to use the covariant derivative and do a little more work, and you end up with this that this expression here, which is exactly that second order constraint expression, is up to a constant equal to this guy here, and that means that you could then say, okay. Why don't I express vacuum general relativity by using that this is equal to zero rather than the usual rigid tensor equal to zero? And then at that point, this is as far as I understand it reasonably well. Um, what Tony then did um, was work very hard to see what various approximations to this look like, and that's in the paper in there. Um, and I, I will not try to describe that to you, but maybe in a year's time I will try to describe it to you in that I need to work through that in the same way that I worked through things up to this point. Yeah. Thank you very much indeed. Should perhaps take any burning questions or any one burning question? Could you mention the word Maharana so it fulfills your Um I didn't get to talking about Maharana. There you go. Can I the next year? My name is So uh, a, a quick announcement about two sets of possible fun and games later. So one is um, Lou, Diane, and I want to do a group demonstration of Pascal's mystic hexagram in the supper group. So we have here lots of cord, and we have chalk as well. So in the traditional way, as we have done before, some of you have done, in this hall here, that we can actually draw out, pull out all together, and we can demonstrate Pascal's linguistic hexagram. Now, so that's one, so that's the supper break. Now another is, now Diane is going to help me because I, on Friday, have to decorate a wedding cake and I'm a bit behind. So I have lots of marzipan and if anybody feels like modelling either little stars, little leaves, little flowers, or little animals from Tanzania, like elephants, <laughs> lions, uh, hippopotami, things like that. You know, while we're watching and listening and taking in, it's sometimes good to have something to do with your hands while you're taking things in. Then I have some marzipan. Then there's a whole new dimension. Then. Exactly. <laughs> so anyway, so those are the two lots of fun and games, which of course is the real reason why everybody comes down. <laughs> I take it you're doing life science ones, because they're not that little. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. It's for a wedding cake, which is <coughs> that high, four tiers. But little stars, flowers, leaves, also yeah, very, very well. That sounds lovely. I'd love to try. Okay. All right. Well, so, so, yeah, so, um, or what we can do? I'm, I'm going to go for.